Hi, welcome to the Chaz Palmentary Podcast. We got a great guest today, but like I always do, I won't tell you who it is. First, I want to tell you about my site, chazpalmentary.net. If you'd like to see my one-man show, I'm doing a United States tour starting in March. Chazpalmentary.net, you will have the whole schedule. Also, if you want to buy my car, the saddest thing in life is Wasted Talent. And I have original posters from the original one-man show. Uh, so many things are on that site. Please check it out, chazpalmentary.net. Go to my restaurant, 30 West 46th Street or 264 Main Street in White Plains. So, very excited. Finally got him on the show. So many people asked. They said, why don't you get him on your podcast? Well, I did. Here he is, the one and only, the real deal. A lot of guys bullshit they're the real deal. But, folks, this is the real deal. Michael Francis. Michael, so great to have you on the show. Chaz, I had to get you all the way out on this, this end. I told Michael, I'm going to come to L.A., I'm going to get a studio. I'm here at Paragon Studios, and I'm going to get you, and we're going to do a podcast. So, Michael, it's so great to have you here. And, uh, Chaz, always great to be in your company, and I do have to say something. I've been to the restaurant, sensational. Well, thank and you. And I'm from Brooklyn originally. I know good food, great food. You got to go. <laughs> I appreciate that, Michael. Thanks a lot. You know, so many questions to ask you. Now, we all know, obviously, your life. You, you, it's an incredible life, how you turn your life around, how you put it for good, uh, how you help so many people, not only uh, uh, people who are... You, you help CEOs, you help you teach how to leadership, and I think that's incredible. But I want to go from the beginning, Michael. Like, you grew up, your dad was a, a captain, right, in, in, in the mob. The real deal, obviously. As a little boy, this is a question I always wanted to ask you. When did you notice that something was different, that your father wasn't just like John Smith who worked in the, the bakery or something? Was there a moment you noticed something? Yeah, you know, Chaz, it, it actually happened two times in my life that I really, you know, was, wow, something's going on here. Right. One time, believe it or not, I was probably four years old. Four? Four years old. I'll never forget, my dad, I was living at my grandmother's house with my mother in New Hyde Park, Long Island. My dad was gone for a couple of days. I didn't know where he was, but he was gone. Then one day, he happened to come home to my grandmother's house, and I was upstairs, I came down, I sat on the steps, and I'm watching my dad come in to, my, to see my mom. Right. He's got a, almost a full beard, he hadn't shaved in days, and he had a heavy beard. I noticed, a guy outside, Joey Brancata, I called him Uncle Joe, but he was like my father's right-hand guy. Right, exactly. Standing on the, on the front patio, kind of pacing back and forth. And my dad is hugging my mom, and my mom is crying. And I said, man, this, this isn't right. Something's going on. Something's wrong. Yeah, and I didn't quite get it because I'm four years old. And, you know, then I brushed it off. But then cut two years later, I was probably nine or ten. I'm traveling with my dad. We're going into Manhattan. We were out on the island. And uh, we're going to his uh, recording studio that he had, a record label, I should say, that he had. He stops the car. We had two guys with us, two, two more of his guys that I called Uncle Johnny and Uncle Red, <laughs> you know, but the, they were his guys. Right. And my dad gets out of the car and he's having a heated discussion with some guy, okay, about something. I don't know what, but I'm watching. And Chaz, I'm not kidding because my dad was a strong guy. He picked this guy up by the throat and just kind of, you know, held him up in the air. And I seen Johnny and Red get out of the car, and, and Johnny looks at Red and said, this is not good here, something's going on. And I said, what is this? You know, what is this about my dad? Because he just, everything came out, and then I started to realize, then shortly after that, you know, he was under surveillance, and cops started coming around. Right. I said, all right, there's something really going on here. But that, that really got to me when I saw him lift that guy off the ground. Right. And he was right. angry. And I mean, you were he was about mad. nine years old. I was about nine years old, yeah. What, did people, did you find that people treated you different because of who your father was? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you saw the movie uh, Goodfellas where Henry Hill went into the, right, you know, right. in the back of the Copa. We did that all the time. I mean, I was going to the Copacabana from the time I was six, seven years old. I saw every act you could imagine there. And my dad was always treated like gold, ringside table, wherever we went. So we always had that kind of, you know, courtesy given to us and to him. But right. I didn't know why. At you that didn't point. know why. No. But, but when you were like 17, 18, what was it like? 
being your father, being the captain like that? Well, you know, I mean, it started getting difficult. It was in the early 60s when he started to be arrested and go on trial and back and forth. And, uh, you know, so much stuff went on. Uh, unfortunately, it was during that time that I started to hate the police because my dad keeps getting arrested. Our house right. keeps getting disrupted. Uh, right. You know, he's in jail. We're visiting him. He was going on trial. I mean, so all this stuff started to happen in my teens, you know. In your teens. In my teens, yeah. And the people, when you were hanging out with your friends, and they had to treat you differently because they knew <laughs> you had their boss's ear. No doubt. I'll tell you a funny story. I was a baseball guy. I played baseball. Right. My dad, no matter what he was doing, he would never miss a game. He would show up, you wow. know, always come no matter. He'd come late, but he'd always right. show up. So, uh, you know, baseball was really my sport. My dad loved to come. And, uh, you know, I'd be playing ball, and I'd always be looking for him, right? And let's say I'm up to bat, and I'm looking for my dad, and all of a sudden, here he comes. He <laughs> drives up in a big black Cadillac or a black Lincoln. That was a car right. back then. He was always late, so he never pulled into the parking lot. He pulls right up to the field, right? <laughs> he gets out of the car, Chaz, dressed in a suit, always dressed sharp. He's got five or six guys with him, never traveled alone. Right. So he gets out of the car. He walks onto the field. Everybody's looking at him. He goes into the stands. The umpire takes one look at him. Never calls strike three. I mean, when you <laughs> see my dad, I used to say, hey, Pop, you're very good for my batting average, you know? But <laughs> no, nah, he was he was great. It, even in football, I mean, I, nobody wanted to tackle me when he was in the stands. I mean, he, he had that kind of a presence. Wow. Yeah, he that's, really did. I, you know, that's amazing because we talked about that before you and I, that what do you think it is with people that, they just go crazy over, you know, I mean, look, of course, the police, they want everybody, they all want to lock guys up, but but they're regular people, but they want to be around them, but they don't want to be around them too much, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, they don't want to be too close to them. But people are enamored by by gangsters, by, by I don't know what that is, man. You know, look, my dad had really had a presence about him, so I kind of understood that, the way he carried himself. He had right. charisma. So, I mean, I, I noticed that early on, but no, you're right. I mean, people wanted to be around him. They flocked to him. But you, like you said, I found out later, they didn't want to get that close because they, want to they get felt, that close. no, they felt that, hey, you yeah. know. Somebody... I remember that I was in a band. I was in a band in the uh, uh, late 60s. And uh, we were playing at this place and the Southern Club offered us more money. So I called the owner there and I told him, I said, no, we're not going to be there. I, I told the bartender, you know, we're not coming in next week. Mm -hmm. I have another job. And I, I, I went to this other place, this other uh, bar to play, you know. And I remember the guy called me up and uh, he said, if you don't come in my place, I'm going to throw the whole band in the street. Mm. And he threatened me, you know. So I went to my father's friend who was like, my uncle. He wasn't mm -hmm. really my uncle, but like yeah. they always said, yeah, call, always me call, uncle, yeah. call me uncle. I had Joe. so many uncles that weren't my uncles. So many uncles. They weren't, he wasn't my uncle. But I said, Uncle Dom, you know, I, I told Uncle Dom, and he, and the first thing he said, you know, these guys had these guys. I told him the story. He says, What? Who said what? Get in the car. <laughs> Get in the car. Yeah. And I knew what that meant. We're going there. Mm -hmm. Got in the car. We went there. So we walk into the thing. So my friend, my Uncle Dom walked in and he said, Dom. And then he sees me right behind him. I'm like, you know, 21. And he says, he said, you know who this is? It's my nephew. You talk to this kid like this? He says, you big tough guy, you threaten the kid like this? What's the matter with you? He goes, Dom, you know, you're supposed to be here. I don't give a fuck what he said. Mm -hmm. He's not coming. That's it. Don't ever talk to him like that again. He goes, you understand? He's with me. He's my kid. He's my uncle. He's like my kid, this kid. And that was it. Yeah. The guy never called me back again. And I'm telling you right now, Michael, every time I would go there just to visit friends or going out, never paid for a drink ever mm -hmm. again, ever. That's how it goes. And you know what? That was intoxicating. <laughs> yeah, that's, hey, listen, you know, look, people are attracted to power, they're attracted to money, they're attracted to powerful people. Yeah. And listen, the way guys carried themselves in that life, you know, my father being one of them, uh, it's attractive to people. It's you attractive. Want, you want a piece of it. You want a part of it. You want to be around it. Yeah, I had a, I had a, I had a best friend, and I'll tell you this. It, we'll get on to other things, but I had a best friend, my friend Phil Folia. He was a district attorney. Mm -hmm. He was underneath Ju Rudy Giuliani, who I'm mm -hmm. sure you know very yes. well. Yes. <laughs> you know, who, who put a lot of uh, guys away, but uh, and this woman, this this woman 
went to my my friend's wife because they owned a beauty parlor. And the wise guy, these they weren't wise guys. They were like wannabe wise guys. Kept breaking the windows mm. of the of the beauty parlor because they wanted to buy him out because they wanted to expand. Mm. So they went to his wife. They went to his wife and said to my friend Phil's wife, "Could you could Phil do something?" They knew he was under Giuliani, you know. So Phil says, "Well, unless you catch them doing it, right? Unless you have they didn't have cameras back then. There's really nothing I could do, right?" There was nothing he could do. So he said, I'm sorry, but you have to catch them doing it. Mm-hmm. So the woman said, okay. And she told Phil, I'm sorry. She happened to mention it in the beauty parlor to this woman. She loved going and getting her hair done. Who was it? One of the wise guy's wives. Wives, I knew that. <laughs> she said, who's doing this? She was, I, don't, I know it's them. She told her husband that this is a beauty parlor. We all love coming here. Why are these guys doing this? Mm-hmm. They came to her, these guys, after he wanted to speak to them. They apologized for all the windows. They paid her the money back for the windows they broke, mm-hmm. and they never broke windows again. Yeah. Well, you know, Chaz, in our neighborhoods, that's what we did. Right. We took care of the community. You we took, took care, care of the people community. in the neighborhood. And I remember, Nobody Phil, missed. remember Phil telling me, Chaz, I'm the second most powerful guy around in New York under Rudy Giuliani. I couldn't, I couldn't do, do anything. anything. Yeah. These guys went in, spoke to them, done. Well, you know what people don't understand? Maybe they do, but I don't think so. In the old days, when guys from Italy first came over here, right, and they settled in the neighborhoods, yeah, maybe they were getting protection money they would right. take from their own people. Their own people, right. But that stopped. Yes. You know, as we became an organization, Goza right. Nostra in this country, right. we started taking care of our, our neighborhoods and our communities. I right, mean, right. Listen. You know, we were running numbers in in Greenpoint and uh, and uh, Williamsburg. Everybody was was playing a number with us. Everybody, every family, every shop owner, every woman. We right. took care of them. You know, and we helped them earn. They, they hit the number. Earn. They earned money. Everybody loved because us. Because you, you you like when if they look, it's, it's same with Gotti. I mean, his neighborhood loved. They him. loved him. They've loved him. Christmas, New Year's, that, you know. Absolutely, because if a favor was needed, he gave it to them. No crime in the neighborhood. We didn't have any crime. We didn't have any crime. Nah, my, my sisters used to come home at, you know, 12, 1 o'clock. If they were walking down the street alone, they'd have two, three people escort them home. We wow. never closed our, our windows or our doors. I mean, sometimes, you know, we didn't have air conditioning wave when I was a kid. Right. We'd leave the doors and windows wide open. Never worried about anything. Wow. Never. Now, what do you say? No, I, I talk about this thing the, my, on my show, and you and, and it's great because I'm doing uh, defining moments, folks. Mm. Just like neighborhood logic, I'm doing defining moments. Like every person has a defining moment mm-hmm. that changed the course of their life. So I'm you're the you're the first one I'm having on my defining moment segment. I'm sure there was a couple of defining moments in your life. That changed the course of your life. Would you uh, share them with us? Yeah. You know, the first major change in my life was a whole change in direction for me. And, uh, you know, my dad never wanted me to be part of this life. He right. wanted me to go to school. He wanted me to be a doctor. He always said, son, you're going to be the first professional in the family. I was pretty good in school. You know, I got good <sighs> grades and all of that. And he right. was, my mom and dad wanted that. Truthfully, they wanted me to be a doctor more than I wanted to be a doctor. But I wanted to please him. I love my dad. He was great to me. Right. And then he gets in trouble. You know, he goes to trial a couple of times. He beats a couple of cases. But then they indict him on this bank robbery case. He goes to trial. He gets convicted. They give him 50 years. 50? 50. 50. 5 It was the longest sentence for a bank robbery conspiracy case. He was supposed to have masterminded a nationwide string of bank, or bank robberies. Ever given up to that point. He's out on uh, appeal for three years. Back then, they let him stay out. Right. Not like today. You don't get a minute today uh, if you're a guy like my dad right. or me. After three years, he loses all his appeals. Boom. He's in Metropolitan Detention Center, which was the federal jail in, uh, in Brooklyn, in Manhattan. I'm sorry. Right. And I go visit him. And I never had this discussion with him. I said, Dad, bank robbery? Really? Wow. And he looked at me and he says, I want you to look me in the eye. I said, okay. He said, I'm innocent of this charge. I'm no bank robber. He said, the four witnesses against me were all junkies. You know, I don't deal with drugs. And and Chaz, my father hated drugs. 
my whole life, he used to make up stories about people that, that got strung out on drugs to scare me and to never use any drug. Right. And until this very day, I've never touched a drug, never smoked a joint, never touched wow. nothing. I mean, it, unless I'm sick and they give me medication, but never did drugs, scared the heck out of me. And uh, he said, I'm innocent. He said, I'm no bank robber. I didn't commit this crime. He says, Michael, we got to do something to overturn this conviction or I'm going to die in jail. I said, Dad, what do you want me to do? I said, I'm not going to school anymore because I had been involved with Joe Colombo and the Italian American Civil Rights League. I said, I'm not going to school. He said, if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. He asked me a couple of questions and then he proposed me uh, for membership in that life. And that was life changing. His words to me, I'm innocent. I'm going to die in jail if we don't overturn this conviction. Wow. That was enough. So that was one of your defining moments. That was, that was a change the course of my life. Change direction. And, I mean, that's uh, literally changed the whole course of your life. Changed the whole course of my life. Because if he never would have gotten in trouble, maybe you would have been a doctor. Yeah, I would have. He would have would not have wanted me in that life. So he would have pushed me. And you know what? I would have went through the whole process just to please my dad. I mean, I was a pretty good student, you know, but right. I would have done it for him and my mom. I remember years ago, I remember reading about you in magazines. And uh, I wasn't famous yet. I remember, and I, I was reading about you. I said, wow, who is this guy? That you just walked away from the life and you, uh, and I was saying, nobody walks away. This ain't a civil service job. You know, how did you, how, how did you end up doing that, Michael? You know, Chad, I had kind of a plan. I mean, I'm in the life for a long time already. And what happened was they, I don't know why, I, I guess obviously because I had the name, but from the time I was 20 years old, I was getting arrested and I was making headlines and all this kind of stuff back in New York. I went to trial five times. I had a total of seven indictments. I had 18 arrests. I mean, they, were, they didn't give me one inch. Well, they said that because your father was Sonny Francis. Yes. And that's why. Yes. Right. So I had the name to start with. Right. And then uh, I beat this big case that Giuliani indicted me on. And I'd be, if I don't lose, if I don't win that case, I wouldn't be here speaking to you now. He would have given me a hundred years. And he said it. He said it in the courtroom. He told my lawyer, I'm going to give you a client double what his father got, which would have been a hundred years. hundred years. Yeah. Wow. So I beat that case. Within a couple of months, they indict me again on a big racketeering case, the gas fraud tax. You probably heard about yeah, it. Sure. Gas tax fraud. So I'm in, and they gave me no bail. So I'm in... Uh, the federal jail again in Manhattan, and I'm with everybody. Everybody's getting indicted on racketeering cases, right? I'm with Jew and your person, everybody. We're all in there, Fat Tony, the whole crew. And I'm watching these guys go to trial. And Chaz, they're coming back 50 years, 100 years, oh, 150 geez. years. I said, my God, I beat them all of these times. How long can I beat them? I said, if I get convicted, I'm the youngest guy ever. They're going to give me 300 years. My life is over. And that's when I started to say, I got to make an exit here. I got to figure this out. And uh, and that's really when it started. And at that point, I had already met, you know, this young woman who was going to be my wife. And I said to myself, look, my dad's involvement in that life destroyed our family. My sister dies of an overdose of drugs. My mother without a husband for 30 some odd years before she died. My other brother was a junkie. Destroyed, right? I said, I just met this young girl. I'm going to marry her. Am I going to do the same to her? Because that's wh exactly what's going to happen. So I got to make a choice. Either I'm going to try to preserve my life, or I'm going to stay in here and go to jail or get killed, one or the other, because right. our family was always at war, Columbus. And that was the defining moment was me being in MDC and watching these guys go down. And I said, that's my, that's my fate. If but I you ended up so. beating that case, right? No, I took a plea on oh, you that. took a plea? Yeah, I, I'll tell you how serious it was, Chaz. I said, if I go to trial and risk this, I'm dead if I lose. But I beat them so many times, I have some leverage. Maybe they want to get a conviction on me. And that's when I started to tell my lawyer, let's try to see if we can negotiate here. When I got 10 years, they originally started with uh, 25 years on a $100 million fine because they claimed I robbed $2 billion. They said a $100 million fine. I told my lawyer, forget it. I'm not doing that. And then w over a three-month period, we whittled it down to $15 million fine, $5 million in restitution, and a 10-year sentence. And I said, 10 years I can do, because I was under the old law. They still had parole. I said, maybe I'll do five, said, whatever. And so I take the deal, right? I said, this was the defining moment, because at least I'm preserving my life. 10 years plus 15 million. Oh, let me tell you this. 
When I got 10 years, they were congratulating me. Michael, don't even take your shoes off. You'll be home before you know it. The guy said, what a deal. That's a wonderful deal. They would congratulate me, pat me on the back. And you know what? It was. It was right. a great it deal. It was a great deal. Yeah, and I had a 15, $14.7 million fine and a $5 million in restitution. Wow. Something like that, yeah. Don't even take your shoes off. Yeah, that's what they told me. Wow. I mean, Michael, you got to tell that story about the guy. We, he, he, they never said his name. And then they said his name. Could you say, you don't have to say his name, but could you tell that story? Which one? The one you told me about the guy. He said, they said his name once at the beginning of the indictments and oh. they never said it again. I mean, this is how devastating, you know, surveillance tapes are and all this yes. stuff. I'm on trial with Giuliani several months. Right. I had 15 co-defendants. I was a lead defendant, me and Jimmy Rotunda, right? Another right. big guy. Right. And uh, there was a union guy. Now, you got to understand that these RICO indictments, 15 defendants, I didn't know eight of them. You never, know, met, eight guys. never met them, never heard of them, didn't know who they were. We're all at the defendant's table together. Right. <laughs> so we were saying hello to each other. We're on trial together. So this one guy, nice guy, union guy, in the opening statements, they mention his name. And then we go several months. They don't mention his name ever again. Not one time. Right. So now the day we're going to wrap up before it goes to the jury, we go to lunch and I'm saying, when I say, hey, look, don't worry about it. You're going home. They didn't even mention your name. They don't even know who you are. Don't. You're going home. Don't worry about it. He says, okay. Last day, now they put the case on against him. They play one tape. <laughs> Chaz, one tape. And we're all sitting there. They got a tape on him. And here's the tape. He's on the tape saying this. They're in a conference room. Right, right, in right. In a place where this allegedly happened. And he's telling everybody, hey, we're committing a crime here. If this office is bugged, we're all going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. It was a three-minute tape. It was his voice. They verified it. He gets convicted. He gets seven years. Wow. So that's why it's real important. Don't talk on the phone. <laughs> Don't talk on the Don't phone. Don't talk on the phone, folks. You know what my dad used to tell me? Yeah, this is crazy stuff. He used to tell me, Michael, the phone is a cop. Just look at the phone as a cop. Wow. He said, keep that in your head. And I never got caught on tape to where it ever hurt me. I'll tell you how crazy my father was, crazy like a fox. We're in the house, and when he wanted to talk to me, if we didn't walk outside and go like this, you know how the picture on yeah, the mound yeah. when the catcher comes, they go like this? Yeah. You know, we, we go out. If we were in the house, he's, come on, I got to talk to you. We go into the bathroom. Nice. He shuts the door. Put the water on. Puts the faucet on. Right. Flushes the toilet. And leans into the sink. So we're talking into the running water. This wow. is how he used to do it. This is how you had to do that. Yeah. And you know what? When they built our house, they installed a bug in the kitchen of the house. So the house was bugged. He didn't know that, but he was just assuming the house was bugged. So they never really got him on tape. They never got him on tape. Well, not until later on. <laughs> Later, Later on, on, I got him on tape, but, but he was in his 90s at that point. I think he was losing it a little bit. But Well, your dad was how old that, when he died? 103. 103. I got to tell you another funny story. Go ahead. My mom had passed away in 2012, right? So I go to see my dad. They were nice to me. They gave me a special visit. They put me in the attorney's room, right? Just me and my dad, because I had to let him know. So we're in there, and I go in there. And I never see my dad depressed. All the time he's in prison, he's never depressed, right? So I go in there, and he's depressed that day. And I said, Dad, what's, right? what's wrong? He said, what do I got to live for? He says, I'm in this rat hole. That's what he says. I'm, he's probably going to die in here. He says, my wife passes away. I'm married all these years. They don't even let me go to the funeral. I said, what do I got to live for? I may as well die. I said to him, I said, hey, you're getting weak on me? He said, what? I said, I want to remind you of something. He says, what? I says, 1967. We're in the courtroom with Judge Jacob Mishler. You just got convicted. You got sentenced to 50 years. The judge looked at you and he said, Mr. Francis, you got anything you want to say to the court? You looked at him. I'll never forget. I was in the first row. He said, yeah, Your Honor. I'm going to fool you and everybody in this courtroom. I'm going to do the whole 50. This is what he tells him, right? So I said that to him and he goes, you're damn right. I ain't dying till 2017. The hell with that judge and everybody else. Do you know what? He outlived the judge, the prosecutor, every one of his co-defendants, every witness. He outlived them all. That went into his head. He said, I keep my word even to that rat judge. That's what he wow. said. Holy shit. That's, that was my father. I mean, I heard stories about your father, Sonny, that he was, 
He was legendary, man. He was. He was. There's no doubt. He was. Yeah, they don't make him like that no more. No, no. Let yeah. me let me tell you something, Chaz. You know, let, let me the good and bad part of that. Okay. Yeah. Because when we were alone, me and him, we would talk, and you know what he would tell me, Michael? This life is full of shit. He says, full of baloney. Yeah. He said, nobody's going to help me. Because I used to say, Dad, nobody's doing anything for you. Nobody's going to help me. We got to do it on our own. And I'm saying, why? You were the underboss. You got so much respect. You got 50 years. You kept right. your mouth shut. He said, nobody's going to help me. We gotta, he says, his life is full of shit. He used to tell me that all the time. But here's the thing. My dad's legend meant so much to him. So much that there's no way he was ever going to cooperate, ever talk about anybody, because his legend of Sonny Francis meant so much. And I wow. used to, I'll tell you, I had one, one falling out with my dad when I said to him, Dad, this life destroyed our family. I said, you made a choice. It destroyed our family. And he would tell me, he would say, it's not my fault. I got framed. I said, but Dad, you didn't get framed because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. You <laughs> right. got framed because we're street guys. They're coming right. after us all the time. He would never take responsibility for anything that happened within the family. He would wow. blame my mother. He would blame, And I, I, I just was really upset with him. I said, Dad, just take responsibility for but it. But don't you think, Michael, that, and we say this as a cautionary tale to people, that the life, the life is really not the Godfather. It's, it's not no. the movie, The Godfather. Most of them... I mean, do you know anybody? I mean, we, we, folks, this is the guy who's the real deal here. And I will ask you, do you know anybody who was in the life who had a good life? I'll tell you even worse. I don't know any family of any made member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated. Totally. And you look at any one of the guys. I mean, every one of their families, including my own, and not my wife and kids, but my brother, my sister, my mother, wow. my father, destruction. So any lifestyle that does that to a family is a bad life. It's a bad life. And the guys, the guys suffer too. And, and you know, look, it, it was different years ago before the government really got all the tools that they got. Right. Because years ago, it's chess. You go down on a crime, you get 10 years, you do three or four on right. parole, you're out, you're on the street. It's no big deal. But today, forget it. They kill you today. Today is 40, 50 years. 40, 50 years, and you get no parole. You're not you're coming not, home. You're, yeah, you're it's, not going to do it. It's over. You're going to rat. You, it's over. Look, you know, they used to, I, I used to say it's the, the young guys in this life now can't stand it anymore. They're, they're not built like the other guys. But I said, wait a second. A lot of the guys that turned informant are old timers. Because back then, like I said, you got a couple of years, eh, no big deal. But today, they say, hey, this is where you're going to spend the rest of your life. That's it. Guys don't stand up on that ice, guys. They don't. There's, you know, there's only very, very few guys like Sonny Francis that would stand up. The other guys are not doing it. Wow. I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know. You, you stand up, but um, you got to do the time. Yeah. And look, you, you bring nothing but the... It's not... I always say this. The mob life is not conducive to a family life. You want to be in a mob, don't get married. Don't have kids. Don't do it because today you're going to get destroyed. There's no escape. Yeah. I remember there was this big wise guy in my neighborhood, and he was standing on a corner once, and uh, there was a priest there. That, you know who the priest is. And uh, I was with him, and my friend Phil, we were, four of us were talking. We actually, the priest was talking to, the, to this big mob guy, a made guy. Mm -hmm. And his son was walking up the block, arguing, with, not arguing, but him and his friend were yelling at each other about, I don't get, you know, and as all of a sudden they get close to us, the father says to him, what the hell's the matter? What are you guys yelling about? And, he's, and, he, and the kid says, right in front of us, Right in front. He goes, no, Dad, I'm trying to explain to them that what that guy did was wrong. You know, the guy, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to kill that guy. The guy's got to get whacked. He's saying mm. this right in front of all of us. And the father goes, what the hell's the matter with you? What are you talking like that in front of everybody like that? So what's, get over here. What's the matter with you? And he like pulls him a little to the side, not all the way to the mm -hmm. side. He goes, what's wrong with you? What's the matter with you? What did I teach you? If you're going to whack somebody, you don't yell it out in public. Mm. And I'm like, God. Wait a minute, was that fatherly advice? Yeah, I mean. Was that a father who just said that to his son? And do you know what happened to that guy? That guy went to jail. It was it, They had a beef with these guys from the Purple Gang. Mm -hmm. It was a guy, yeah. okay, you remember? Okay, he killed two of them, ended up going to jail, 
And he killed another one in jail. Mm. Killed three of them. What kind of advice? Look, look. What do you expect to happen to this kid? Of course. Kid? You know, Chaz, my, uh, there was a time when my dad was out on parole not too long ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe less. And my son, John, my oldest boy, was driving him around a lot. Right. You know? And I'm saying, you know, I'm hearing from my son, a little bit from my dad. And I get on a plane, I go into New York, and I sit down with my dad. I said, Dad, why, why is John driving with you all the time? Right, yeah. He says, well, you know, he's a good kid. And I said, Dad, if you got anything in your mind about bringing this guy into this life, forget it. He said, I'm telling you, don't do it. Well, maybe he won't. I said, no, Dad. Wow. Yeah, I said, no, Dad. I got a hold of my son. I said, let me explain something to you. I will chain you to the basement until you come to your senses. <laughs> Jesus, God. I said, it's not happening. You don't have a shot. Between me and your grandfather, they'll crucify you in this life. You don't have a shot. I said, don't even think about right, it. Right, they'll be looking to put this I kid said, away. I said, don't even think about it, number one. Wow. I said, and number two, this is not for you. And and I said, Dad, you got to give me your word. I want your word right now. And he gave me his word. He said, all right, this is what you want. I would not wow. bring one of my kids into that life no matter what. Wow. Yeah, because it it just doesn't work, Michael. No, it doesn't work, Jazz. It's uh, look, I I don't I don't uh, you know I don't like to talk about anybody uh, because it's it's not about the guys. It's about the life. It's, it's about just, the life. It's the life. But I mean, let's talk about what you're doing now. I mean, for those of you, I'm sure you know, uh, Michael has this incredible podcast, uh, the Mike, Michael Francis podcast show, and it, it's absolutely. Unbelievable. That's how I got to meet him because I was watching his podcast and I said, man, this, I, I really love what he has to say because he's so positive. And, and uh, t tell us, Michael, what, what are you doing now with, you, with, your, with, your, with your own life and how you spread the word of, of, of trying to change people's lives? Well, let me, let me tell you what happened. They had me in, uh, this was the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing in my life. But I'm in a hole in Lompoc and uh, federal prison. I'm there 29 months and seven days. Now, I'm for those people who don't know what the hole is, that's solitary. Yeah, I'm in solitary. And uh, they had me there in administrative detention. They were really giving me the business. 29 months. Every day, Chaz, I write the lawyer. I mean, I mean the warden, the lawyer. The warden. I got a yellow pad and pencil. I'm writing the warden. Warden, let me out of here. I can make it on this yard. Don't worry about me. I'm not going to get killed. Every single day for 29 months. Finally, a CO comes down to my cell. He says, the warden wants to see you. Now, I never met the warden. They don't come down to the hole. You don't see anybody, yeah. right? I said, great. I go to, to, up to the office. As, as I'm walking into the office, I see the warden. He's looking at me, and he goes over. He says, come here. He goes to his file cabinet. He pulls it open, and there's all my letters because they had to keep them. And he says, Francis, you're wearing me out with these letters every single day. I said, hey, warden, I got a lot of time on my hands. I may as well write to you, right? right. So he says, I'm going to let you out. He says, you're not stupid. You're not going to try to escape. You got six months left to go. If you thought you were going to get killed, you wouldn't want to go on a yard. I said, thank you. I said, look, I lost all this weight. I got a pretty wife. I want to get back in shape. I got a couple of months. He says, okay. So he lets me out. He makes me sign a waiver. If anything happens to you on a yard, you're not going to hold the Bureau of Prisons responsible. I said, I'll sign anything you want. I'm out on the, I'm walking the track. It was Lompoc like. It was a beautiful day in California. I said, I'm free, right? I'm listening to Billy Joel on my Sony Walkman. Remember those two? Yeah. <laughs> you know the Sony Walkman. I'm walking the track, and all of a sudden, you hear over the loudspeaker, Francis, report to the warden's office. I said, oh, man. I said, he's going to change his mind. I was what you call a central monitoring inmate where any movement on my part had to be approved by Washington, right? All the wise guys. So I'm going to the office, and I'm, I'm creating my speech that I'm going to tell him, right? Right. As I get there, it gets worse. I see two guys in suits. I don't need to see the badge. I see the suit and the shoes. FBI agents, right? Right. I said, oh, man, they're going to try to get me to cooperate. I, I turn around, I walk away. I said, guys, leave me alone. Put me back in a hole. Don't bother me. I got six months to go. Francis, get back here. We want to talk to you. I said, leave me alone. They said, get back here. Now I'm thinking maybe something with my family happened. Why these guys right. see me? I go in the office, and they say to me, uh, how, much, how long have you been down? I said, I've been down almost eight years. You guys put me here. You know that. I said, what do you want? They said, uh, we, want a, we want a favor from you. I said, no favors. I said, there's going to be strings attached, no favors. Let me do my time. They said, just listen. 
They said Major League Baseball, the uh, NBA, NHL, NFL are getting together to do an anti-gambling video. I had a gambling operation on the street. I had a bunch of bookmakers working for me. And they said, uh, you know, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to show that you turned your life around. You claim you're a good guy now. I said, right. yeah. They said, uh, we want you to participate in a video. I said, a video? You guys are telling me I'm going to get killed because I walked away. <laughs> I said, now you want me to do a video? It's got to be a setup, right? Right. I said, no, it's, it's the real thing. I said, look, I don't do videos. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I get out of jail. They said, look, if you do this, we're going to sweeten the pot for you. I said, what do you mean? They said, we're filming this in Chicago. We're going to take you out of here for three days. They said, we're going to put you in a room. You got a king-size bed. They said, you know, order room surface, pasta, macaroni, whatever you Italians eat. I'll never forget the way he said it. He said, go take a dip in the pool. We'll watch you. <laughs> he said, and do this video. He said, who's better than you? I'll never forget, I said to them, I say, guys, I've been down almost eight years. You get my wife in that hotel room, I'll do a video on anything that you want. I said, you know, eight years is a long time. Right. And they said, we'll try. What happens is the day they're going to take me out, we have an earthquake in California. And all movements stop. I'll never forget shit. it was money. I said, oh, my God. Anyway, because I agreed to do it, NBA Productions comes into the prison and I do the video in there with them because I told them, yeah. yeah. And I told them just exactly how we put our athletes in trouble. I said, I'll tell you the whole thing. It's a big deal. Right. When I get out, they, they come to me directly, the head of security for all the leagues. And they say, hey, this video is terrific. It's really having an impact. We want you to come and speak to the players directly. I said, I don't speak. What are you talking about? I don't do stuff like that. I'll never forget, Jazz, the uh, head of security for Major League Baseball, Kevin Hallinan, he, uh, he was a, a former... Uh, New York City homicide detective, big right. Irish guy. So he looks at me and he says, oh, you're a big, tough mob guy. You're afraid to speak to some athletes? I said, all right, set it up. I'm coming, right? 1996, I went to spring training with all of Major League Baseball. I spoke to all 30 teams, all their uh, uh, minor league teams. Then it brought me to the NBA. Then I started with the NFL. That's how I started speaking. Wow. And I'm saying, and these athletes are like, they're in awe. And I would tell them straight out, you know what I tell her? I go into a football, the NCAA jumped on in 1998. No, since then, I've spoken over 300 universities. Told right. her, what would oh, you yeah. tell these college kids, yeah, the NCAA? I tell them straight out how we're going to, uh, you know, how we're going to set you up in a gambling thing. I would get, when we'd go into uh, an NFL day, I mean, uh, uh, NCAA, the uh, college football, I would tell the coach, like Saban and all that, I said, I want your biggest linemen in the front row. Biggest guys. Okay. I got these big monsters sitting in the front row, right? After I do my thing, I look at one of them and say, hey, you, stand up. I'm just like that. He says, what? I said, stand up. What do you, get up. I'm telling you to get up. Just like that, right? And they said, you're a big, tough guy, right? He said, you know, and they go like this. I said, let me tell you. I said, on the field, I wouldn't have a shot with you. You'd eat me up alive. I said, but let me tell you this. You step over this line and you come into my world, I'm going to make a sissy out of you. You don't have a shot. You know what, Chaz? The whole place is quiet. They sit down. Wow. They're a big, tough guy like that. And, uh, you know, from yeah. there, it just went Because you know, when went you're crazy. dealing with serious guys and serious money, shit happens. Yeah. I told him, you play by rules in football. I play by my rules. We don't play by the rules. Yeah. I said, I play by my rules. I make them as I go along. I said, you don't have a shot. Wow. And it had such an impact that I've been doing it since 1996. Since 96. 96. And how long, what, your, you, your podcast has been on, what, a year and a half, two years? Uh, I think we started, yeah, the reason I started it, because when COVID came, I had like 42 speaking dates canceled. Canceled, I, right. I looked at my team, I said, what are we going to do? I had no idea about YouTube. And they said, right. let's go on YouTube. Right. And that was in uh, July of last year. And wow. It just blew up. I it just know. blew up, yeah. just crazy. Just went crazy. Yeah, for those of you, you really got to go tune into this podcast, this Patreon, it's really... An incredible, uh, in-depth uh, knowledge, not only of the mob, but, but of how to like change your life. Here's a perfect example of a person who, uh, you had to go down the, the trough, as they say. You, know, oh, you yeah. fell down. I hit bottom. How you have to, hit bottom. isn't it true? Everything comes from pain and suffering, Michael. No doubt. You know, you know what, Chaz, the first night when I violated my parole and they put me back in a hole and they told me, you'll never see the street again. We're, we're going to destroy you. That's exactly what they told me. Never see the street again. They told my wife the same thing. And I had babies at home and everything. Oh, man. That night, 
without a doubt, was the only time that I ever felt hopelessness. Like I said, this is it. I'm done. And I'm a guy that was always felt I was in control of my life. So that's because they let you out and you violated the parole. I violated like, was, a, like a fool. Yeah. And, uh, and they put me back in and they said, and they were going to indict me on another charge. They said they had a murder charge. They were coming after me. They, they, just, they just hit me with everything you could imagine. Mm. And that night I just said, my life is over. And I was only like 39 years old. I said, this is it. I'm done. I'm finished, you know? And, uh, you know, it, it's also when I became a person of faith during that time in the hole. Um, you know, my wife has introduced me to my faith and my mother-in-law, who is a, a very, uh, wonderful woman of God. And it was during that time that, you know, I kind of turned my life around. I mean, I was into my Bible a lot and I came out with a different outlook in life. And wow. it was out of desperation when you have no place to turn, you know, uh, let me tell you, Jazz, when you have no place to turn, you turn to God. Uh, you turn to yeah, God. No doubt. People go, no, 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 I don't believe in God. But sometimes, sometimes, oh, yeah. you know, you turn to, and I always go, I always tell people, okay, you don't want to believe in being born again. That's that's your decision. Mm -hmm. But if you just follow the book, the Bible, as yes. a book, yes. just as a book, all right, you don't believe in the higher being, whatever. You just want to follow, you want to read a book like you would read any book and follow that, you have a great life. Absolutely. You know, you know, Chaz, there was one verse that really got, and I had never really read my Bible. You know, I grew up a Catholic, but yeah, you know, to me it was exactly. like a subject in school, but right. I was reading uh, the book of Proverbs and um, it was really down, it was that first night and because a, a prison guard handed me a Bible because he came to look in on me and I said, get away from me. I chased him away and he came back and just slips a Bible through the door, uh, through the slot in the door. And I picked it up and it just opens to the book of Proverbs and I'm reading Proverbs, never read it before. And I came to a verse and this was another defining moment when I think about yeah. it. It was Proverbs 16, seven. Right. And it says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. And for some reason it just struck me. I said, it's almost like I looked in the mirror. I said, oh, who are you kidding? I've been a criminal. You know, I'm a criminal. You know, my ways aren't pleasing to the Lord. I think I'm a good guy. I'm really not. Wow. Even your enemies are at peace with you. I'll tell you how much of an impact it had on me. I have it right here. Wow, there it is. Yeah. Because every morning I remind myself, this is, don't get ahead of yourself. You know, you should be grateful for where you are. And that made me really think, really think about my life and which way I was going to go and what I was going to do. And rather to get bitter and angry and... I was going to try to make a change. Well, and, and think about that. You changed your life. It's an amazing story. You have this beautiful wife, beautiful children. You wouldn't have that if you didn't. No. And Chaz, I'll tell you this too. When I walked out of prison, if you read the inside cover of my book, everybody predicted my death. Life magazine, the prosecutors, the they FBI. Said you were gonna get whacked. I'm gonna get whacked. This is there's, there's no way he's gonna make it. They all predict them. And and honestly, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I don't sell my former associates short. These are sharp guys, very right. capable guys. Right. I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I said, look, you know, I gotta take a shot with this. I'm not looking to hurt anybody. I don't want to do that. Right. But I gotta try to survive. Did you ever, Michael, when you first I'm sure when you first got out, did you look over your shoulder a lot? I did. I mean, I was very conscious of uh, my, I still am. Jazz, for still some, am. I still am. You know, when I walk down the street, I'm always looking around. It was just, it's just instinct, you know, but yeah. when I first came out, cause I had one or two close calls, you know. Where, you did? Oh yeah. Yeah. You always get like a hero, a cowboy who wants to do something. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. You know, and, and uh, you know, I had a few little incidents, but uh, I'm still here. You're still here.